Thank you very much, Gail. Uh, well, welcome everybody, and thanks for joining us tonight. My name is Dr. Dustin Ranglock. I am the field station leader of the Utah Field Station of the USDA APHIS Wildlife Services National Wildlife Research Center and uh, project leader of the NWRC Predator Project. So our focus is uh, all about resolving human wildlife conflicts with predators, and that largely focuses around, um, you know, how do we prevent predation on domestic livestock? Um, and so I'm based in Logan, Utah, uh, at the Utah Field Station, where we have a, a captive colony of about 100 coyotes that we use to try to address uh, various questions surrounding uh, depredation of sheep, goats, cattle, et cetera. Um, and this particular webinar tonight, um, we're, we're grateful to have you all here to, to talk about livestock protection dogs um, and really try to give you a fairly broad overview of the different work that has been done and is being done with large livestock guardian dogs or livestock protection dogs um, from a variety of different perspectives. So I'm going to kick us off and kind of give a, a presentation of some of the uh, livestock guardian dog research that has uh, been conducted by NWRC over the years. Mostly I'm going to focus on the most recent work, um, but I'll touch a little bit on, on some of the historical uh, things that have been done previously by NWRC. Uh, and then I'm going to turn the time over to uh, Bill Costanzo, who is uh, with Texas A&M AgriLife Research Center as a livestock guardian dog research specialist. Um, and he'll talk about some of the work that he's doing there before we turn it over to our, our keynote batting cleanup for us, Julie Hansmeyer, who is a uh, sheep producer um, in both Colorado and Utah and has been working with sheep and dogs for um, a long time, 25 years of breeding dogs at least, I would say. So uh, Julie definitely has uh, some excellent kind of on the ground uh, insight for us that, that uh, me as a researcher, I'm just not able to provide. So we appreciate her uh, joining us today as well. Um, following that, each of us is probably going to take 15 or 20 minutes, um, and that should leave us time for any sort of questions at the end. Uh, so if you have any questions, scribble them down, um, and we'll save them for the end of the meeting where we can do kind of a Q&A panel discussion, um, and we'll wrap up by 7.30. So um, with that, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, and if at any point you can't hear me or see my slides, please let me know. Uh, the internet connection out here is not always the most stable. So somebody just chime in and interrupt if, if something doesn't seem to be going right. So, all right, so uh, NWRC uh, was among some of the first to, to bring livestock guardian, dog, uh, livestock guardian dogs to North America back in the 1970s. Um, and this was largely kind of focused uh, around concerns over predation by coyotes um, on, on sheep and goats. And so, uh, our, our landscape, especially the uh, the predator populations on our landscapes, have, have changed pretty dramatically since the 1970s, um, where at least in much of the western U.S., we're now dealing with wolves and bears um, in addition to coyotes, and we've seen expanding populations of mountain lions and, and other critters as well, whether we're talking about grizzly bears or black bears. All of these populations are just expanding and growing and becoming more and more of a problem. Um, and so that led to NWRC, a real impetus for us to uh, to conduct some some new work um, uh, to really scientifically evaluate the effectiveness of livestock guardian dogs on this modern landscape, and to evaluate some new breeds um, from Europe uh, that were specifically imported from areas that uh, had historically and and currently uh, were experiencing problems with depredations from wolves and brown bears uh, to try to react to that change in the predator landscape. And so uh, that was kind of the main objective of this overall study, but with specific questions uh, surrounding, and I'm sorry, my, uh, my slides aren't advancing very well on my end, surrounding how these different breeds uh, behave differently and the impact that they have uh, on sheep survival. So the three questions that this study uh, specifically uh, was examining, and this was work that was largely done by uh, doctors uh, Julie Young and Daniel Kinka. The first question was really focused uh, specifically around the sheep themselves and sheep survival. And does that vary by the different livestock guardian breeds, uh, as well as the predator species that they are uh, exposed to? 
The second question was, do the different livestock guardian dog breeds behave differently? Um, are some more apt to roam further from the sheep? Uh, do they have different behaviors in terms of their, uh, how investigative they are, how well they assess a threat, um, how vigilant they are when they're working with the sheep? Uh, as well as, and then the final question was, how do carnivores and other wildlife respond to these livestock guardian dogs? And so they specifically evaluated uh, four different breeds of livestock guardian dogs. Um, if we go clockwise here from the, the top left, this is the Portuguese Cao de Gado Transmontano. I'll just refer to it as the Transmontano moving forward. Next, we have the, the Turkish Congo dog. Here is the Bulgarian Karakachan. And then finally, uh, they did this comparison to just like the, the standard American, and I'm, I'm using quotes here, white dog, which we know is, is often kind of a mixed uh, breed of Pyrenees and Akbash and uh, a variety of other, uh, other breeds that have been typically used since the 1970s here in North America. So the question really was, do these three novel breeds from Europe, from places that have had long experience with wolves and bears, are they perhaps better suited to deal with predation on this modern landscape? These dogs were placed um, with a variety of different sheep bands across five different northwestern states, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming. All of these different bands would be exposed to potentially different levels of predation from these various different predators. There are more grizzly bears in some areas. There are no grizzly bears in other areas. Wolf populations are established or expanding. Um, various prey densities within these areas. But by having a large distribution of a large number of different sheep bands across all of this, you hope that uh, you start to be able to evaluate some signal that is coming through um, despite all the, the variation at each of these individual sites. They then went about collecting data on the behavior of, of these dogs. So they had GPS collars on all of the, the livestock guardian dogs so they could see how they're responding, how they're moving, um, what they are doing relative to the sheep. That also includes some specific behavioral trials that I'll uh, discuss here in a little bit. Their space use, that's information gathered from uh, the GPS collars. Looking at mortality of the sheep. Um, so you know, uh, those of you are who in the audience who are producers certainly understand that you know you know how many sheep that you've put out. You know when a sheep is killed. Um, you know how many sheep you bring in. And so they're able to specifically evaluate uh, mortality from the various different predators and how that varied based upon which breed of dog and number of dogs uh, may have been defending that particular band. And then finally, space use of the different predators and other wildlife in the area was determined using uh, trail cameras uh, that they set up in areas uh, before the sheep band arrived, while the sheep band was there present grazing on the landscape, and then after the sheep band left. So jumping into that very first question of which livestock guardian dog is best for which predator. This is an important question. Um, you know, the, the number of, uh, and type of predators that each of you are experiencing in your operation is gonna vary. And so there, there's not necessarily going to be a one size fits all dog that is going to be the right solution for you in your area with the predators that you are experiencing. And so they specifically evaluated the various different um, breeds of, of guard dogs to see which were more effective for each of these different predators. And I'm going to skip over all of the specifics as to how this was done because I don't really want to get into the statistical weeds with everybody. But again, this question was specifically focusing on the sheep. So of the thousands of sheep that they were monitoring that were being protected by livestock guardian dogs um, in these five Northwestern states uh, over the course of uh, several years, um, we're able to evaluate what the effect of those uh, dogs are. And basically the way the statistical analysis for this section worked um, was you can kind of think of as the, the standard American white dog as the baseline. Um, and so uh, for all of these, we're basically talking about if you were to switch out one white dog for one of these other breeds, what is the, the change in the risk of predation 
um, in that case. So you're keeping the overall number of dogs protecting a given band constant. You're just switching out a white dog for one of these other breeds. And when we hold all other variables constant, the substitution of one Congol for one white dog decreased the risk of sheep predation by nearly 60%. Um, likewise, when we substituted in one Karakachan for one white dog, that would decrease the risk of sheep predation by about 80%. And the substitution of one Transmontano for one white dog decreased the risk of sheep predation by uh, about 95%. So you can see all of these uh, appear to be much better suited for protecting sheep in this modern environment, uh, better than the American white dog. Um, but within these, there's obviously still fine scale differences. And this particular type of model that they used for this analysis wasn't able to specifically break down uh, the, the relative impacts that each of these breeds would be having on the protecting sheep in the face of different predators. And so this is kind of thinking broadly in general what is the effect? Um, and in this case, the, the Transmontano is, is doing an excellent job. But if we look more specifically um, using a competing risk model, here we're looking specifically by breed by breed, but also being able to break out the risk of depredation for each of our different predators. Um, so here, when we talk about just for our Turkish Congo dogs, um, when we substitute in, again, think of this the same way, you substitute in one Congo dog for one white dog, so we're not changing out the, the number of dogs or anything like that. Um, we, we don't see a significant decrease in the risk of predation overall, but when we look at the specific predators, increasing the number of Congos in a band um, uh, decrease, is associated with a 69% decrease in sheep predation risk from cougars a 67% decrease in predation risk from black bears and a 44% decrease in risk from coyotes. However, this gets balanced out a little bit um, with uh, a 31% increase in risk from uh, wolf predation, where the effect of kangles on brown bears was not significant. So we can see that if you're dealing with cougars, black bears, or coyotes, kangles could be very effective but in areas with wolves, perhaps not. Now, I wanna put a great big giant asterisk next to this um, because this data was highly um, influenced by one particular sheep band in Idaho, which in 2014 lost 19 sheep to wolves. Um, and this band was, protect or, uh, was protected by uh, a group with Congo dogs. And so we see that this one summer, this one event essentially is really strongly influencing what is happening. And for that individual producer, that was a major impact. But overall, most of the, the producers who were running sheep with Congos did not have the same sort of problem with wolves. Um, and we think that they there can be quite effective in that case. Um, so this is something that is interestingly both very biologically relevant um, but statistically irrelevant, um, which is a really interesting case here. Um, and I should say that the the producers uh, for that band of sheep, they they felt that they would have lost even more sheep if it wouldn't have been for the Congo dogs. So even though they lost 19 in that one summer, um, they they felt like it would have been worse without the Congos. So they still felt like Congos were were doing a really good job there. Next up, if we move to the um, Bulgarian Karakachan, here uh, we see that substituting a Karakachan for a white dog decreased the overall risk of predation by 49%. And when we look at specific predators, this is where we really see um, in the face of coyote predation, the Karakachan really shines. Uh, increasing the number of Karakachans in a band was associated with a 93% decrease in the risk of coyote depredation. So if you are running sheep uh, or goats in an area that only has coyotes, you don't have to worry about wolves or grizzly bears or black bears or anything else, the Karakachan may be the way to go here um, because it, it really decreased the risk of coyote depredation in this case. 
Uh, we did not see a significant effect on of the risk of wolf or cougar predation. And then for bears, uh, the, the particular models here failed to converge because no brown bear killed a sheep in a band with at least one Karakachan, and only one sheep was killed by a black bear in a band with at least one Karakachan. So you could take this two ways, and I'm going to tell you which way you should take it, but you can take it in two different ways. First, it could be that the Karakachans are so good uh, at bears because they kept there, there were no bear depredations that were happening in places where you had Karakachans. Um, that is one interpretation of this. The second, and the one that I would try to steer you towards, is just that we had a small sample size, and statistically, it's it's difficult to evaluate these things. And if you never have the event happen, well, you're not able to actually model the effect of it. So um, you can you can take that for whatever it's worth. And then finally, when we look at the Transmontano, overall substituting a Transmontano for a white dog decreased the risk of predation by 66%. Um, but when we looked at specific predators, um, we saw a non-significant decrease in the risk uh, from coyotes, so it did go down, but not significantly. And then the wolf, brown bear, cougar, and black bear models all failed to converge, again, because no sheep was verified as killed by any of those predators in a band that was uh, included at least one transmontano. So again, the two different interpretations, transmontanos are awesome and make it so that you don't get any losses or you have a small sample size and we just haven't been able to fully evaluate that. Um, I would go with the small sample size here, but it does suggest that they do a really good job um, at protecting uh, the sheep um, where, where they had the transmontanos. So which livestock guarding dog is best for which predator? That's gonna entirely depend on, on where you live um, and which predators you're exposed to. Congols are probably better for cougars, black bears, coyotes. Um, so if that's what you're dealing with, you know, maybe you're in Utah or Nevada, um, a Congo dog might work really well for you. Karakachans are better in places with coyotes. So if, if you're in uh, Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma, um, and you're not having to worry about uh, some of these other predators, coyotes might be the way to go. Um, the question is, you know, are Congols worse for wolves? Some of this could just be an artifact of the livestock guardian dog age. That one band that, suffered, that had uh, 19 sheep killed uh, of the total 31 that were killed um, when they were protected by Congols, the, the 19 that were killed in the one band, um, that those were young dogs um, that maybe weren't quite experienced yet. Um, and so that could be uh, a problem. And then just that une uneven distribution of wolf depredations in the data. Of the 31 sheep that were killed by wolves across the entire study, 19 happened in one band in Idaho in 2014. And so that is very biologically relevant, but statistically difficult um, as you start to deal with it. But we do see some differences in, in which predators these different livestock guardian dogs are uh, work best for. They all seem to be, do a little bit better than your traditional American white dog. So now the question is, do these breeds behave differently? You know, if you're going to switch out from uh, the white dog to a Congo or to a Transmontano, Karakachan, can you expect the, that dog to behave in the same way as your American white dog? And, and basically what we see here, um, that there are no differences between the breeds in terms of the distance to the sheep. And so here uh, we have uh, and sorry, it's a little small for me to see on my screen here. Um, so it's probably is for your, on the, in the top left, this is the white dog. Top right is the Transmontano. Bottom left is the Kangol and bottom right is the Karakachan. And this is just basically showing across the hours of the day, uh, going horizontally, how close are they to the sheep, um, on our vertical axis. And we can see that the pattern on all of these is very similar. During the early morning hours is when these dogs are closest to the sheep. And that's exactly when you would want to have your dogs close to the sheep, because that's when they're, the predation risk is probably the highest. That's when the predators are going to be most active. And so you want to have your dogs right there with the sheep. 
as we move into the day, the dogs tend to be a little bit further away from the sheep. Maybe the sheep are grazing along. The dog found a nice shady place to lie down for a little while. We're not as concerned during that time. Predation risk is generally lower during the day because the predators are not as active. But then as it gets into the evening and nighttime hours, they, again, they move closer to the sheep at that time. So all of these dogs are behaving in, uh, very similarly um, with regard to distance to sheep. If we look behaviorally, honestly, all of these dogs are more similar than they are different. And this was evaluated using a really interesting uh, study where um, when they, they set up uh, a wolf decoy or a deer decoy in an area that was just out of sight of the sheep band and of the livestock protection dog. So the sheep band is down here in this draw. Here we have our wolf decoy. Um, there's a trail camera set up onto this tree so we can see what's going on. They have a howl box that's going to play a sound uh, when they have the wolf decoy that's actually playing a howl. When they have the deer decoy, deer don't make a lot of noises, so they used a, an elk bugle, um, but they wanted to try to have it be about the same size, so they didn't want to use a, an elk decoy, so they used a deer decoy so that it'd be a similar size point. And then they set up on an observation point up above uh, where they could see what was going on. And they would turn on that howl box and then watch and see how those livestock guardian dogs responded. And was there a different response, whether it was the wolf decoy versus the deer decoy? And what they found is that the Karakasans tend to be more vigilant. They were very responsive when that uh, went off, whether it was a deer or was it a wolf. They tended to be the first to go and, and check it out and see what was going on because they were paying a, a lot of attention to what was going on around them. The Congos were much more investigative, um, so they came and were really checking out this decoy and what was going on and, and to the point where they actually had to stop some of the trials early because the, the Congos were spending too much time investigating this fake decoy um, and they were starting to worry about the, the sheep being unprotected from uh, a real wolf that might come their way. And the Transmontanos were better at assessing the threat. Uh, so when the Transmontano came up, if it saw that it was a deer, it pretty much immediately turned around and went back and, and went back to the band of sheep, where if it was a wolf, it spent much more time there investigating. So other differences in behavior, the Transmontanos tend to spend uh, less time scanning than the white dogs do, um, and the Karakachans tended to move around a little bit more than the white dogs. But on the whole, they tend to be more similar than different. And finally, just really quick, how do the carnivores respond to the livestock guardian dogs? So this is, again, where we set up trail cameras in front of the sheep and looked at what predators did we see in an area and how many before the sheep arrived, during the time that the sheep were there, and after the sheep had left. And the thought here is that basically, you know, a, a domestic sheep is a vulnerable prey item that's not really able to defend itself. But when you mix sheep with livestock guardian dogs, you end up with a defended prey item um, that may be essentially that unit of sheep combined with livestock guardian dogs might almost act similarly to a wolf pack in the way they exist on a landscape to where they push out other predators uh, that may be in that area. Um, and, and kind of claim that territory for that time. And what they saw for all large carnivores combined, wolves, brown bears, black bears, and cougars, both band presence and the state in which they were in were significant predictors of the detection prob probability um, in the highest ranking model. And overall, across all the years, large carnivores were about half as likely to be detected when the band was present as well as after the band left compared to when uh, before the band arrived. So basically, when you have protected sheep from livestock guardian dogs, you have fewer predators in the area. Not, you know, th that doesn't necessarily change predation rates, although from what we saw earlier, it definitely impacts that. But there, there's just fewer. These predators are being pushed out. Wolves in particular, were significantly less likely to be detected uh, when a band was present than it was before they arrived. Coyotes, however, on the other hand, were more than three times as likely to be detected when a band was present than before the band arrived. So um, essentially, by, by pushing the wolves out, it kind of creates space for those coyotes to come in, um, 
which again, that may run counter to your objectives. For, for brown bears, black bears, cougars, red foxes, everything else, uh, they did not see any different. Um, it seemed that they were less likely to be detected when the, the band was present, but um, th there, there probably just wasn't enough of a sample size to really fully uh, tease that out. And so the effectiveness of livestock guardian dogs may actually be related to changes in space use from these predators. When we see that uh, the, the livestock guardian dogs are coming in with a band of sheep, that does almost act like another wolf pack and it displaces wolves from that area. But that's seemingly not so for other carnivores and, and particularly for coyotes. We see this meso predator release theory, which is essentially when you kick that top predator out, the mid level predators come in and increase in abundance. So by kicking the wolves out of an area, we've actually created more space for those coyotes to come in. So what do we see with other wildlife? I put this in just for, for some interest. Um, deer were about half as likely to be detected when a band was present than before a band arrived. And that effect persisted even after the band had left the immediate area. Uh, but for elk, moose, pronghorn, there weren't really any significant differences that were detected um, and, and changes before, during, or after the sheep had grazed through an area. So what are, what are my overall conclusions here? Basically, livestock guardian dog behavior is mostly similar. Uh, these three new breeds that they brought in, the Transmontano, the Karakachan, and the Congo, they did not really differ significantly in the way they behaved. Um, they tended to stay with the sheep the same amount. There were some slight differences in how investigative or how vigilant an animal was, how well it was able to distinguish a threat from a non-threat. But overall, they're pretty similar. But we do see that some are more effective guardians for certain predators than others. Karakachans are awesome for coyotes and if you're only dealing with coyotes. Congols are really great if you're dealing with bears and coyotes. Wolves, in some cases, may be great. In some places, maybe not. We don't really know because of that one kind of statistical outlier uh, where we had 19 of the 31 sheep that were killed by wolves were all killed in a band killed, uh, protected by Congos. Um, but overall, livestock guardian dogs decrease the detection of wolves in an area and increase the detection of coyotes in an area. But despite that increase in detection of coyotes, we're still seeing a decrease in overall predation um, or, or an increase in the survival of the sheep from them. So with that, I've already taken more than my time. Um, so I'll delay any questions to the end and I'll turn the time over to Bill. Um, Bill, why don't you go ahead and, and while I introduce you, you can go ahead and start pulling up your um, slideshow. I'll try to take Good. mine down. Um, so Bill was hired in uh, January 2019 by the Texas A&M AgriLife Research Center in San Angelo as a livestock guardian dog research specialist. Um, Bill has used livestock guardian dogs on his own farm flock of sheep in Northern California for over eight years. Previously, he was an agriculture teacher and FFA advisor for over 19 years in California. He grew up in the small farming town of Escalon, California, which is in the Central Valley where his parents had a commercial Angus ranch. He has a Bachelor of Science degree in Agricultural Education from Cal State University, Fresno. Um, and Bill's position at the AgriLife uh, Center is a joint project between the Texas Sheep and Goat Predator Management Board and Texas A&M University AgriLife. So Bill's responsible for the care and management of over 20 livestock guardian dogs at the AgriLife Center in San Angelo and it's three research ranches. He's also responsible for a variety of different uh, extension activities associated with getting information out about the Livestock Guardian Dog Program. So with that, I'll turn it over to Bill. Thank you very much for joining us. You're very welcome. I appreciate the invitation. Um, oh, are y'all able to see my screen right now? Yeah, we got it, Bill. Okay. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, oh, I sure appreciate everyone joining us tonight. Um, well, like Dustin said, my name is Stando. I'm a research specialist at the AgriLife Center in San Angelo. And I'm just going to kind of briefly go over um, all the, the program that we have here and, and kind of what we do. And uh, if you have any questions, you know, feel free to write those down and we can get to those at the end here. 
So basically, what's the purpose of our program? Uh, you know, we're hoping to increase the understanding and the effective use of guardian dogs um, by Texas sheep and goat raisers to help decrease the amount of predation and the wildlife uh, livestock conflict um, that happens here in the state. And so um, we focus on kind of three main areas, um, you know, we work with uh, very large uh, acreage just here in Texas. And um, the, the three things that we're kind of focusing on is the, the roaming behavior, uh, bonding dogs properly and, and how to, to do that, and then feeding and health care of the dogs. And so kind of just a, a quick kind of history of, of our program. Um, well, in 2010, uh, the, the Martin Research Ranch, uh, we we started a livestock guardian dog program there. Uh, the ranch was donated to the AgriLife Center in San Angelo uh, by a family there. And uh, it's roughly about uh, 5,000 acres. And they had um, some sheep there. And so uh, they had a very low um, lamb crop at the time. And so they had tried some things like llamas and donkeys and, and even some shed uh, lambing. And so they decided they still weren't getting a very much of an increase in their lamb crops. So they decided to use some livestock guardian dogs. Well, within three years, they went from about a 26% lamb crop to over 120% lamb crop. And so with that, uh, in 2015, they started an, uh, an official livestock guardian dog research program at the center. Uh, they conducted a couple case studies. Um, one demonstrated the um, oh, efficacy of livestock, livestock guardian dogs. And then the other one was a um, oh, livestock guardian dog and predator interaction study. Um, oh, that was done with Dr. Tomachek here. So in 2017, uh, the Texas Sheep and Goat Predator Management Board um, committed funding to the Livestock Guardian Dog Program. And with that, uh, in 2019, uh, they hired myself uh, as a research specialist. Um, so our, our, one of our big projects that we, ha we have had going on since then and, and will continue for the foreseeable future it is a bonding project. And that started in the late uh, summer of 2019. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, as we go along here. So things were getting busier for me, and uh, oh, we hired an assistant uh, to the program last year, and then currently we're um, trying to recruit a, a livestock predation faculty member um, that will help hopefully be able to do some more um, uh, actual research um, on um, uh, predators and interactions with livestock guardian dogs. So what do I do? Well, um, I do a lot of things, but my my main um, oh, functions are producer assistance and education. Uh, I do do a lot of outreach, and and my job is actually probably a little bit more extension um, than it is research now. Uh, develop internet and social media outreach, oversee the the livestock guardian dog program um, at four different research ranches that we have. Uh, we have between fifteen and and twenty dogs. Um, Generally, it kind of fluctuates with the amount of livestock we have, plus usually six to eight puppies in the bonding project, and that's across about 15,000 acres. Um, we definitely have real world ranch issues on, on our places. Um, Oh, only one of our locations is, or at least two of our locations are actual ag life um, facilities. And then we have two research ranches, one the Menard Ranch and then the Reed Ranch in Ozona uh, that were both donated to the, um, the center for research purposes. And so those ranches all have lots of brush and poor fencing and, uh, you know, lots of predators and um, other issues that, that go along. And so um, our dogs and, and our research definitely um, apply to real world um, issues. Uh, we do a lot of research and, and implementation of GPS tracking systems. And, and again, I'll talk to those a little bit more when we get to them. And then I also assist in um, any livestock guardian dog research projects um, that we're doing. So the producer assistance and education that I do uh, really focuses around um, ranch visits, um, uh, workshops for county extension agents across the state. Uh, we do a couple field days each year, usually in the spring and fall, uh, creating fact sheets, um, videos on YouTube, uh, webinars that we do once a quarter, and then uh, oh, just all the general social media sites, um, answering questions and making posts and that kind of thing. So where's most of my producer contact from? Um, well, surprisingly, uh, we've had about 1,250 contacts to date um, of these 
specific things, but the majority of it is through social media, surprisingly. Um, and that number continues to increase um, all the time as our, our followers on our social media sites increase. So about 46% of, our, of my contact with producers comes from Facebook, um, Instagram, or YouTube. We get about 28% from email, about 26% um, phone. And so what are people actually looking for, you know, the information they need from me? Well, about 50% of the people have some sort of a behavioral issue, um, generally with, you know, an adolescent dog uh, that they have. And so they're looking for some sort of help from me. And, and normally those conversations are, are multiple times until we get the issue um, figured out. And I may end up even have to do a, an in-person visit sometimes. 20% of people are looking for a livestock guardian dog, um, and so we were maintaining a list of, of breeders here in the state um, oh, for quite a while. And then about 16% of the people have some sort of question about uh, using GPS trackers or, or having issues um, finding one or something along those lines. So our social media and internet sites, um, you know, these are our Facebook page. Uh, we have, we're up to about four to five posts a week. Uh, we do a variety of things. Uh, we did quite a few research polls back in um, oh, 2019. Give general program updates of what's happening. Um, oh, on Tuesdays, there's usually some kind of a helpful tip. And we're up. Uh, when I started, we had about 1,500 followers. Um, oh, as of uh, about a month or so ago, um, we're over 9,000. And so that number continues to increase. About every five months or so, we jump about 1,000 people. Uh, we also have an Instagram account and then the YouTube channel. Um, we're up to 67 videos on the YouTube channel. And uh, that seems to be a, a real popular thing for people is to watch YouTube videos. And, and in 2022, um, oh, we had 1,300 hours of time that was watched uh, on our YouTube channel, and, and we're already almost uh, close to breaking that for 2023. So we have about 1,500 followers on there, and again, that number continues to increase all the time, too. If you're looking for you know a bunch of information that we have on our um, about our guardian dogs and and things that we've done, uh, you can get onto our website that's listed down here. You can also sign up for my monthly blog, and we have quite a extensive uh, research library that's on there also now. So some programs that we do, um, you know, we've been tracking movements of the dogs, uh, movements of the dogs and livestock. Um, you know, I mentioned researching different types of GPS trackers, um, the bonding project that we have. We've done some game camera studies and then making some feeder improvements and also feeding station design um, improvements to help ranchers out here in Texas with their dogs. So our GPS program, um, Gosh, I, I don't know how many different types of GPS trackers that we've used just in the uh, four and a half years that I've been here, but it's been a lot of different ones. Um, when they initially started tracking the dogs uh, before I started, they were using, you know, the, the wildlife trackers, um, kind of similar to some of the ones that you saw in the last presentation. And they were fairly expensive, about $2,500 a tracker, and they didn't give live data. And we had to wait for the, the company to get us the information back. And so... When I started, um, oh, the, the director of the center at the time, um, he wanted me to find some new types of trackers. And one of the biggest things was battery life and, and ease of use and, and that type of thing. And so the, the current system that we have um, seems to be the best one that I've found. Uh, we've been using this system for a little over a year now. And it's a um, the company that, that makes this tracker is Digital Matters, and it's the Oyster 3 LoRa tracker. So it's almost real time for us. Um, we have the, the tracker set uh, for 15 minute updates. Um, so at any point in time, you know, I can pull up on my phone where all the dogs and livestock are that we're tracking at any point. And that's uh, about 73 different trackers right now. Um, with this system, we're looking at about a five month battery life. You know, they're, they're relatively inexpensive. They're about $100 and you pay about a $5 monthly fee. And one of the nice things is it takes just normal double a lithium batteries that you can pick up like a nice package of them at walmart and it, it also has a geofence notification which you know if your dog gets out um, it's going to notify you via text or um, your app or email kind of however you have the system set up and uh, it, it's worked really well for us and basically the system uses some sort of a um, sending receiving unit like the one that's pictured over here on the uh, left hand side yeah you, know, you can mount it on a pole 
um, on top of an old windmill, on top of your barn. Um, you know, if you've got some type of uh, Wi-Fi antenna or something like that at your property, um, basically what the thing does is the, the tracker sends a signal to this sending receiving unit and then it uses power um, off a solar panel or, or 110 to send the signal to a cell tower. And so, um, you know, it, it really helps with battery life. It helps decrease the cost. Probably the only um, disadvantage to this situation is if you have a ranch that's larger than four miles across or maybe four and a half miles across, you would have to set up a second one of these towers to be able to continue to get um, all service for your trackers. So um, one of the, the newest units that we're, we're trying out is a ear tag tracker. Um, we've actually attached it to some of the dog's collars. And uh, uh, we've had some difficulties with that unit. Um, basically, what happens is the dogs uh, go to scratch on their neck. Um, they're scratching up this panel that's on the front of this unit. Um, and eventually, it gets so torn up that, that it's not uh, charging correctly anymore. But I do think this would be an excellent system if you wanted to track livestock, um, you know, or cattle, anything like that. Um, it would probably work fairly well for you. So what do we learn from all these um, GPS trackers that we have and, and data that we collect? Well, we look at things like guarding patterns and movement of the livestock with the dogs. Um, are the dogs roaming? Because there is a pattern that, that we see with dogs that roam. Um, and then also, you know, predator pressure. So the, the picture in the middle of the screen or, or the one on the left here, um, it, it's from a case study that they had done um, oh, back in 2017. And so this shows a picture. All these are points so that the dog traveled and, and directions that the dog moved. And so you can tell that this dog did a really good job uh, of covering this pasture that they were in. There's lines all over it, uh, mainly on the perimeter. Uh, it's a little bit heavier. Um, oh, but there's definitely movement across the whole pasture. And so if you look at the other picture over on the right hand side, uh, this guardian dog definitely wasn't as effective. Um, now, this is the same amount of time for, for both of these dogs that they were tracked. Um, but you can tell that this dog is staying predominantly in this corner of the pasture. And one of the main reasons is probably because there, there's feed and water in this location. And so what happened is there was still predation that was going on this ranch um, because the dog wasn't wasn't staying with the livestock well and wasn't covering these other areas um, that are left open. So this slide kind of goes along with, with what you saw in the last presentation. Um, so what we did, and this is about a year and a half's worth of data um, in 2019 and 2020 on one of our ranches. Um, you know, we can see that the, the time starts out basically at midnight. And these two lines, the red line is the, the distance of guardian dogs to, to other guardian dogs. And then the blue one is is goats to livestock guardian dogs. And so the dogs predominantly stay with the livestock and they're not moving a whole lot um, at night. And then in the early morning, they start to get active. They peak about 9.30 in the morning, and then it kind of goes down throughout the middle of the day around lunchtime for us. And then they start to get active again, um, oh, roughly about two o'clock here. And so um, at least for, for our um, tracking purposes here, it's a little bit different than the, uh, the data that you saw in the last presentation, but the dogs stay predominantly close um, to the livestock at all points. And so they're really not any more um, active at night uh, on either the, the early morning or, or late in the evening. Um, everything starts to kind of settle down um, and they, they, they travel an average of about seven miles a day. And so why is that important? Well, for us, one of the things that I mentioned earlier that we try to focus on is feeding and, and health of the guardian dogs on our ranches that we work with. And so we use information like this to try to encourage producers to, to feed a good quality um, kibble to their livestock guardian dogs and not go down to Walmart and just buy a pallet of Old Roy um, because it's cheap for them. So kind of moving into our um, bonding project, uh, basically what we do is we take three to eight, uh, eight week old pups each round, and we're testing um, pairs of dogs versus singles. And then we're also looking at um, oh, testing dogs that are bonded in pens with hot wire and then dogs without hot wire in the pens. And so uh, basically kind of what happens is we get the pups at, at two months old. Um, we don't do any um, breeding or whelping of dogs. We purchase or get all these dogs donated from breeders here in Texas. And so the pups arrive, everybody gets vaccinated. Um, they're, they're put out into a, 
a 60 by 60 pen. Um, oh, then at three months of age, they go into a one acre pen. We do switch the pups um, oh, because it's easier for us to switch the, the dogs around than switching livestock so that the dogs are bonding to a species instead of specific animals. And then at six months of age, um, the dogs move out of that bonding pen into a pasture that's roughly about 100 acres. And all the time while the dogs are in the, the bonding pens, um, we're socializing them three to four times a week. Uh, they get leash training, tether training. Uh, they get a truck ride once a week. Um, and all those things are, are to help keep the dogs socialized and be able to handle them a, as adults. So as time goes on, um, usually about eight to 10 months of age, the uh, dogs are placed on cooperating producers' ranches. Uh, they're also scored at that point in time for socialization and, and a few other things. And then they get rescored again at, at 12 months and then at 18 months. And at the 18 month mark, uh, producers are able to purchase the dogs from us if they choose to do that. Um, all this time from, from 8 to 18 months, I travel out to the ranches. Um, usually it kind of starts at about four weeks at the beginning, and then it gets up to about six weeks towards the end as the dogs start to mature. And I, I'm working with the producers and, and doing health checks and things like that on the dogs. So um, that's kind of our bonding project real quick. Um, how our pens are spaced out. Each one of these yellow um, pastures that you see outlined here is roughly 100 acres. Um, and our bonding pens are these square uh, or these red squares. And so they're roughly about a quarter of a mile apart. And then between the pastures, this is roughly about a half a mile distance that we have. And so our headquarters, um, if you had the rest of the map, would be kind of way up here at the top of the slide. So they're roughly about a, a mile um, oh, away from these pastures. So the, the dogs don't generally see anybody unless um, it's myself or my assistant going out to actually check on them and, and train them in those things. And so the other picture that's over here is a, is a picture of one of our bonding pens. Um, you can kind of see down the line here, there's just the fence. Uh, it's just some woven wire and there's a, a strand of bob wire at the top and at the bottom. And then this particular pen, um, you can kind of just see the insulators here. This is one of our hot wire pens. And there's also a shelter in there, um, feeder, water trough. And then this uh, in the back is one of our feeding stations. And so this also for us doubles as a, a safe space for our puppies to go into. Uh, in case they're being bullied by livestock in the pens. So what have we found uh, so far the first three rounds? And we just finished up the fourth round, and I, I haven't had the time to uh, oh, analyze all, all that data just yet. But uh, in three rounds of dogs, um, oh, after 18 months, um, the, the dogs that are bonded in hot wire uh, pens are, are roaming the least. And then that, that's kind of followed by, um, oh, single dogs roam the least, and then, uh, oh, pairs. And then if you haven't used hot wire, your dogs are probably going to be, be roaming quite a bit on you um, through that adolescent time. So how do we correct dogs that are roaming? Um, well, uh, we had an issue with some of our dogs that were in a control group um, once they kind of graduated out of our program. And so I couldn't have them roaming uh, across the countryside onto neighbor's property and things like that. So um, we decided to test out the invisible fence systems. And so the, the system that we currently have installed is the invisible fence brand uh, of invisible fence systems that's out there about 2500 bucks and uh, the, the collars are around 800 dollars each uh, the one nice thing is it, it's kind of a you know you pay for it and that's it um, there's no monthly fees or anything like that uh, you don't have to have wi-fi or anything it runs all off of the gps satellites and uh, oh, the one probably disadvantage to the system is you do have to change the batteries fairly frequently um, you can kind of see one of the collars up here in the uh, the top corner that's blue. Um, this is the rechargeable battery that goes inside there. And the batteries last one to two days, maybe two and a half um, towards the end of, of the time that the dogs are in there. But um, what we have seen so far, and this isn't an official study, this is just something that we're kind of trying out and uh, we'll look into um, doing a formal study at some point, but we had three sets of dogs go through so far, and we have seen a decrease in roaming uh, after they've gone through um, the training for three months. Uh, 
And so um, we are looking at other systems. Um, currently, I'm trying out one of these uh, spot-on cars, and, and it seems to be a good system. But again, the, the battery life is just really short. Um, these spot-on callers last about 20 hours. Uh, the one nice thing on the spot-on caller is it has a built-in GPS tracker. This portion over here um, is actually a GPS tracker that's that's built into the caller itself. So you kind of get a two-in-one um, out of that system. So we've done some game camera studies, as I mentioned. And so uh, one of the things is we wanted to see what was going on in our feeding stations at our ranches. And so um, oh, back in late 2018, uh, they did a 30-day game camera study, and they found that Almost 59% of the time, that's this big blue area on your screen, uh, feral hogs were getting in and, and eating all the dog food. And the dogs were only getting in and using the stations about 20% of the time. And then our, our next biggest one, the kind of the gray area were um, raccoons and then the yellow kind of different types of birds, turkeys and that kind of thing. Well, we made some updates to our, our feeding stations, and, and I'll show you one of those here in just a second. And so we just completed a, a short 45-day study across three ranches, and we were able to eliminate uh, feral hogs getting into the feeding stations altogether. We also eliminated sheep and goats from getting in there. And so the dogs now um, are in the feeding stations about 42% of the time, um, but we still have raccoons getting in there an awful lot. And so that, that's something else that we're working on. Uh, birds have increased a little bit. We did have some more use by uh, oh, some ravens and then uh, some possums, uh, skunks, and then a new one this time. Uh, we had a couple of foxes that were um, all getting into one of our, our feeding stations quite often, almost every single night. And so um, just by making some changes to our feeding stations, and I can show you that here. So we went from a system like this that a lot of ranchers um, use here in Texas, which are just some kind of sheep or livestock panels um, kind of wired together. And you can see all the feral hogs in there getting ready to, to tip the feeder over to a system like this one over here on the right. Um, oh, this is a very heavy unit. It's made out of um, oh, inch and a half by inch and a half uh, square tubing. It's got four by two welded wire all the way around it. And the, the one thing that we didn't think about um, oh, was because the pigs weren't able to get in here, they eventually started rooting underneath it. And so we had to add a floor to it um, out on the ranches. And so that's eliminated the pigs um, from getting in there completely. And so one thing that we did have to modify is when we're training puppies, uh, oh, we have to uh, oh, have this welded wire um, just put on here with some hose clamps so that we can train the pups and um, oh, they can get in and kind of jump through this as, as they progress in age. So getting close to wrapping up here, um, we felt the need uh, for a Livestock Guardian Dog Association here in Texas. And so one of the main reasons was, um, you know, to promote more education, just promote the use of guardian dogs in general, um, have a formal industry voice um, for all these uh, oh, animal rights issues that, that kind of come up with dogs from time to time. And then probably one of the biggest things was providing a single source for producers to be able to go to to find livestock guardian dogs um, to purchase. And so we started all this in, in late 2019. And we uh, officially formed the organization in 2020 and then kind of had a slow start because of COVID. But um, the association is up and active. Um, uh, we've got about 60 members or so and about a little over half of them um, are breeders here across the state and even um, outside of Texas. And then the rest is is producers. And so if you're interested in looking up that association on the websites listed, and they also have a, a Facebook page, and then we recently just added a, a YouTube channel also. So that's all I have, and I'm happy to uh, answer any questions, or if you need to contact me, my, my contact information um, is listed there. Thank you so much, Bill. Um, really appreciate that. We'll take uh, questions at the end here. So Julie, if you want to start pulling up your presentation, I'll go ahead and, and give you an introduction here. Um, so uh, Julie Hansmeyer is a range sheep producer in Utah and Colorado. Her educational background is in range science from the University of Nebraska in Lincoln and Texas Tech University. And her operation raises uh, Merino ewes and Akbash dogs. Um, 
and I will let her go into a little bit more detail from there. And Julie, it looks like you're muted still. Can, Dustin, can you see my screen? I, I cannot, cannot. I can hear you, but I don't see the screen. <laughs> okay. Okay. It says it's. Open share tray. This isn't, this isn't the exact. Um, hang on just a minute. Hi, everybody, by the way. Glad to be here. It wouldn't it be a webinar, be a webinar without some without sort of a technical, technical issue. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, how do we do it this afternoon, Dustin? I'm not I'm sure what you did this afternoon on your technical issue. <laughs> Yeah, I had to go, yeah, I had to go up, to to corner, up to the corner, to the corner there next to the there, leave. Next to leave. It says share. It says share. And I, I've been doing that, and it's not sharing. Pretty good. My ribbon is on the bottom, so I wonder. Inner full screen. I see somebody building. If you want to email, you want your, email presentation your presentation to me, real quick, Julie, I can try to share it on my end. Oh man, I've tried that before. Um, I can do it though. I really got a bunch of cool pictures I want to show everybody. Um, yeah, I know you do. I've seen yeah, some of this before. And it's a great presentation. So everybody great. stick around through the, the technical issue. Yep, hang on here just a second. I'll figure it out. Maybe. <laughs> Join conversation. Presentation. There's my presentation right here. I wonder why it won't open. Somebody, Dustin, speak up if, um, um, well, I may have to. Looks like Julie left and is gonna to try to come back here. So, and we'll try to figure out that echo. I could hear it on my end too when, when it was anyone other than Julie. So thanks, Amy. And I, like I said, I've I've heard Julie talk before, and um, she's just got a wealth of experience of how to actually do this on the ground, you know, and and make a make it work for your operation on on a large scale public land allotments in Utah and Colorado. Um, a lot of years of of breeding and bonding dogs and and using her own dogs as well as selling dogs uh, to other producers. And then she's also partnered with uh, USDA Wildlife Services more recently on uh, using some of the Congo dogs in Colorado, um, in particular as they gear up for wolf reintroduction. So hopefully we're able to get this straightened out for you guys, because I know that she gives a really excellent presentation, so. Um, uh, I had a question. 
did you have any of okay. your dogs injured? Um, you know, because of predators, because I know sometimes wolves can be very difficult, very hard on guardian dogs. Or that, did you have any trouble in that regard? You know, I am not exactly sure specifically on that. Um, I was not in this position at the time of that study, but I know one of the reasons why they wanted to evaluate these other breeds was because of that, um, that, that wolves and bears were, were really, um, causing a lot of damage to, to those, uh, American white dogs. And so, uh, it seems like, especially the Congo dogs are very resilient. Um, they're quite large. They're, they can be quite aggressive, um, and are very, uh, very good at defending themselves. Um, but the problem with Congo dogs is that they don't know how to count. Um, and oftentimes two Congo dogs will think that they can take on 10 wolves when that's not just, when that's just not the case. Um, uh, but they, they haven't realized that yet. So, um, these, these newer breeds, uh, the Congo, the Transmontano and the Krakachan were all brought in, um, because that they, they were thought that they would be a little bit more resilient. Um, and, and could deal with uh, larger predators. Um, I'm not sure about any particular injuries. I'm sure that it happens, um, but I can certainly look into that for you. Justin, I'm not sure if I can get on with my pictures. I'm sorry about that. Um, uh, Julie, you, you might just try. Is Are they already open on your computer? Yeah. Okay. So I thought that might work, but. Okay. It is open. Yeah, I have a different. I don't know if there's a different. Um, there's, it's different between the app and the browser ver version of Teams. But my whole uh, what Dustin and I practiced on this afternoon looks different than what what I have now. Because I think I actually right. open open Teams, Dustin, and then I. But. Um, Maybe I just maybe I just visit with everybody for a minute. And and if you if you're able to just kind of visit with everybody um, while you send your presentation to me in an email, I can try to get it pulled up on my end. But you're welcome okay. to kind of however you want to do. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, everybody, but I am glad to be here. And Dustin and Bill, I enjoyed your presentations. Um, I'm I'm a range sheet producer. Um, I got involved in the livestock protection dogs early on, uh, mid 80s, when Dr. Jeff Green and Roger Woodruff with Wildlife Services were, were uh, doing some of the initial research uh, of the livestock protection dogs. And um, the, although there were some pet dogs before the 1980s, really the, the main thrust of livestock protection dogs um, came in the 80s and the 90s. I used to raise at least 20 to 30 dogs a year. And um, over you know 30 years, I, I'm sure I haven't seen everything, but I've seen a lot of things happen, and um, and it wasn't much fun to start off with. We had a lot of we had a lot of problems raising these dogs, and so I enjoyed your presentation, Bill and and uh, Dustin, about the protocol on bonding, um, and, and that's the most important thing that that you can do for success is is first of all to to bond your pups properly, and. Um, I never use a very big space to start off with because you want a lot of interaction between your pups and your and your sheep and like the size of, you know, um, like a horse stall, even for a whole litter um, from seven to nine weeks. And then maybe um, you want to expand that space that's a little tight, but you want to feed on the ground, waste a little hay, make sure your pups are are sleeping right beside your sheep. And it's no time to use a bum lamb or orphan lamb to bond your dogs with your sheep it's use something that's not going to run if you can and because that encourages um that encourages these pups to chase a little bit and they're all going to chase a little bit or they're going to run at those sheep and the best sheep is just a sheep that stands there and just loves on these pups um that's that's one of the ideal ideal situations and then when they get to be like 12 weeks old then you want to expand your space um a little bit two to three pups per pin and then it's only 30 feet by 30 feet. And that's what I've found. I know there's a lot of ways to skin a cat, so I'm not gonna say anybody, you know, that's that's what we've found because if you don't if you don't have that interaction of, and if those pups don't really think that they're sheep and they don't wanna protect them, those are the dogs that are gonna be your biggest roamers. 
there's going to be dogs that don't know what their job is. So if you, those that first four to five months, if you can set that set yourself up for success, that's the best. Um, your your um, it's a good time for your, your to learn for your pups to learn how to eat out of a, a self feeder, and um, also they shouldn't have to fight a sheep for, for dog food, and that's another behavior that you can stop right off the bat is uh, figure out a situation where your dogs can get in the sheep camp, and then you're only feeding your dogs, not the sheep, the dog food. That's a, it doesn't sound like a big deal, but it, but it is, and it can be. Um, and so all those steps from, from seven weeks to, to four months are really critical. And then, um, and then when you introduce your, your pups to independent work, which um, this year I, I introduced a, the whole litter, one by one, by the way, um, into our herd of yearlings, and they all went, they all um, just went like dreams. Um, and they, they never went anywhere, but of course, I don't know my audience here, but we're we're herded, and there's not any fence uh, between Salt Lake and Denver in our operation. I mean, there's they have to stay in the herd. I'm not going to tolerate any dog that that can't that doesn't decide to stay with the herd. And those dogs often go into farm flocks too, and they still they still need to stay there. And and so roaming is a is an issue. I mean, with a with a herder, it's ish, it's easier. Those dogs get in trouble right away if if they're off checking on something. They just better be staying staying right in the herd. Um, we've had Aquash dogs um, from the original days. Um, I hear references to the white dogs. I've kept, you know, a pure kind of Aquash dog breeding line. And just recently, the last three years, I've used Congo dogs. And they're really tough on bear, black bear. And the two herds I have with Congos, um, we haven't had any um, bear problems uh, last year, nor have we yet this year. Um, they're right out front. They're they're really after after that black bear, and they will leave the herd, which I don't like. I don't love that. But the Aquash dogs do stay with the herd. The Congo dogs. Um, this is a probably not a scientific statement, but it's it's a casual statement. And but it does. But the other producers I know have tried these dogs. They can be a little. They can play a little longer in their lives. Um, I don't like these pups to play with sheep. These pups I sent out at five months, they didn't play with those. They didn't play with my yearling ewes. And then when they went with the ewes and lambs, they didn't play either there. They never learned how to play. And um, if they're going to play, I want them to play with each other or, um, you know, an adult dog even. So uh, you can set yourself up for for some success that way by not not letting a bad situation happen. Um, oh, Dustin, I did tell my email did come back and said that's too big. Uh, my too big to send, darn it. Um, what else was I going to tell you? All right. Oh, feeding, um, pro oh, um, feeding, feeding protocol. I was just going to say this is your main contact you have with these livestock protection dogs. So don't, you've got to make sure that works. I feed on a newspaper out in our herds or feed in a, a dish and um, one dog can protect um, feeding bowls, you know, 30 yards apart if you don't watch it. And so that's that's really that's really critical. Um, on the forest, um, you probably have guessed that I go on the forest in the summer and then back um, on the BLM in the winter. And and I have a lot of public use. I, I'm summer right here in Vail, and um, I get a lot of people to the herds. So I have sandwich boards up on both sides of my herds telling them about the dogs. They don't necessarily like the, um, the bicycles, which you guys all probably know. And But at least if you let somebody know that they're coming up to a herd, that helps. And thank you, Wildlife Services. You guys put out some good good signs um, or produce some signs that, that we've been able to use. We also, you know, the, like the, our Colorado Wool Growers has pamphlets that, that we put in our force offices. I always go to um, meetings that, that might be um, 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 pertinent to our sheep operation, like um, the night before a, 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 a bike race or a foot race, if they're going to go into where the where we might have a herd, then I'm always there to talk to that that group of people. Um, who knew that we'd be doing that? But um, it's it's become part of what we do um, as our as as we are one of the multiple uses of our um, public lands. So. Anyway, I'm sorry. I apologize for not having some good pictures because I got some great ones to show you. But 
I'm, I'm glad to answer questions too on training um, or on management. Um, I'm not saying that I've gone through everything, but um, <laughs> I've gone through some, um, <clears throat> a lot of different wrecks and experiences with uh, livestock protection dogs and, and uh, learn from, hopefully learn from most of, most of our mistakes. Dustin? All right. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Good enough. And, and yep. Good uh, enough. Thank, thank you. And sorry we couldn't get to everybody uh, that we couldn't get uh, Julie's uh, PowerPoint to work so that we could actually see her pictures because I know that it's really great. Um, so it looks like uh, Amy was raising her hand. Go ahead uh, and unmute uh, and ask your question. Thank you. Um, I had a question. Um, I guess it um, refers to, I, it's one Julie can answer, but also back to the earlier presentation. What about wandering away? Do you have any trouble with them wandering away from your, and what do you do about that to make sure that they don't wander from your, wander too far away or get too distracted from your sheep? Uh, I'll take a stab at that one first, and is to not let your dogs wander to, to start off with have closed pins um, when they're bonding. And then if you move into a lot size situation, make sure there's not a hole in the corner where they can get out and wander around your farmyard. And then in my instance, they go right to a herd and and um, they don't they don't usually wander. If you can really provide that that bonding experience early, you don't have as, a big of wandering uh, issue because they're choosing to stay with the sheep. I know it's not a good answer. But Bill, maybe he, I heard him talk about some techniques for dogs that already wander. Yeah, so I, I guess for us, you know, a lot of the issues that that we see, we believe, comes from you know not properly bonding dogs. Um, and, and you know what you mentioned, Julie, about some of those things, it, you know, is definitely correct. At least we think. Um, you know, you, you need to socialize your pups well, and we really have seen a, a huge in, decrease in the amount of roaming from dogs if they've been bonded in in pens with hot wire. And so all that stuff starts, you know, at a very young age. Um, you know, our, our dogs spend uh, basically four months. So they're they're two months old when we get them. Um, they spend four months inside of a pen with with hot wire. And then this current round of dogs that we're working on right now, uh, they'll even be in uh, invisible fence when they get out of our bonding pens until they leave um, oh, our facilities to a cooperating producer. So that they don't really get a chance to to wander or leave their their charges um, oh, at our facility. Great, thanks, Julie and Bill. Uh, looks like Tom, you're next. Uh, if you want to go ahead and unmute. I think I'm unmuted. Uh, OK, so um, it's on behalf of the American Goat Federation, thanks to all three of you. This has been excellent, really good stuff. Um, so two questions to throw out uh, for you, one for you, Julie, and it's uh, I'm sure it's one you're familiar with, but uh, and I don't know if there's a super answer for it, but it's critical that when you move from pasture to pasture from the forest to another location that all the dogs go with you and occasionally some of those dogs in in my area get left behind even if they're fairly tame to start with they sometimes don't don't get uh, get rounded up and ready to go and that that then presents all kinds of problems with the public again so any comments or question or thoughts you might have on that julie the other yeah. question would be my, uh, leave both of them with you. Uh, the other one was, do you folks see any differences in these new breeds in relationship, the way they relate to the public in public settings? Thank you. The, the Congo dogs are definitely friendlier to people. And that's one of the reasons that at least the Colorado Wildlife Services, they they had a pilot project. And and they're, they are, they're, they're almost too, uh, too, a little bit too friendly. Um, but um, um, back to back to moving your sheep or goats, um, that's something that that has to be considered every time you move. We move every six months, 
and then we're constantly moving even between our winter country and our summer country. We're, we're moving within our country and everybody's got to know that um, they better catch their dogs. Um, and if they think they got a problem dog, they better catch it a couple of days ahead of time. And, um, uh, you know, I've used a, I've used, you know, a sedative like ACE problem zone. I've, I've tied up all my dogs except my problem dog and spent all afternoon watching him, trying to get him to take it and, um, and then make sure it's not, you know, if it's cold weather, you know, make sure they're not out there in the middle of the night, you know, um, where you can't find him because you need to you make sure he doesn't, um, die out there in the middle of the night. But, um, you know, it's just something you've got to take care of, uh, beforehand. And, um, it's a stickler. And I say that about everything we do, we've got to consider these livestock protection dogs. We never knew that in the old days. We just thought they were, you know, we're going to get them, we're going to, we're going to work. But now we know we got to con- we got to think think about them in every step of of our operation. Anything to add, Bill? Uh, I guess two things I would add because I hear from some folks uh, oh up in the mountain states sometimes about dogs being picked up by animal rights activists and those type of things. I guess I would encourage producers to make sure an ID chip their dogs and keep that information current in whatever database that they they decide to use. And then, you know, the the GPS trackers that we use are really not that expensive. you know, the, the LoRa system, you know, isn't probably something that you could use in the mountain states, but there are satellite based trackers, uh, cellular based trackers that are fairly inexpensive um, that will help you, you know, get your dogs. Um, because the numbers that, that we see, you know, I mean, what you know, people ask, well, what is a guardian dog worth? Um, you know, I would say an adult dog, you know, you easily have thirty five hundred dollars into that dog. Um, I'm not sure, Julie, what, what you kind of calculate, but that the cost of the dog, the replacement, you know, um, loss of production value when you, you lose a good dog, um, it, it, they're very valuable and, you know, to not have a tracker on them so that you can find them and, and get them back again, uh, just doesn't really make sense to me. Thanks, Bill. And, and I would just add back to the second part of that question with the other breeds. Uh, Julie kind of hit on it. Those Congols are very, very friendly dogs. Um, Dr. Kinka, who was one of the, the researchers on that project, uh, I know that there was one Congol that uh, had a, a, some kind of a hip injury and wasn't able to continue, and um, they brought it in as a household pet, um, him and, and his partner, and, and they have it now with their little girl and is a, a wonderful dog um, for their family. But you definitely have to be careful with Congols. Um, people when they're if they're if they're recreating with their dogs out in a particular area if that dog is off leash that congo sometimes is going to rec is is going to perceive that as a threat and may um may cause some problems there but all of the dogs that were chosen for that uh that evaluation the nwrc conducted were chosen because they had some experience with wolves and bears and they also were generally okay around people um but i think that all of us recognize like every there, there's no such thing as a, a good breed or a bad breed when it comes to dogs and people it's often how they've been socialized and how they've been treated um and so uh, i don't want to make too many generalizations there um uh, looks like uh janice uh willard is up next with a question if you want to go ahead and unmute Okay, do you hear me now? Yes, we got you. Okay, so I actually had two questions that came up. One of them I started off with, but I have a second one also. Um, I think I'll start with the second one first, and that's that all of the descriptions that you guys have had have been, um, you know, involved in using these dogs on on uh, um, pretty large, um, pretty large uh, uh, landscapes and. Um, Probably my farm, it's it's big for my area, but it's probably postage stamp size for you guys because I've only got about 80 acres. And um, but, you know, I've still got coyotes, so dogs are useful. So I'm I'm kind of wondering if you have any management um, suggestions for using these dogs in smaller locations. Uh, that's question one. And question two, 
uh, what do you do when the adolescent dogs decide that they want to play with their sheep? I'll let Julie and Bill jump in here. Julie, it looks like you're muted. But still muted, Julie. How old are your how old are your um, adolescent dogs? So my adolescent dog started playing with the sheep when he was about oh gosh. He was about 16 months old. So he didn't he didn't really play with them as a as a puppy, huh? He, he actually did, but we didn't really recognize what it was. He was, he was in with his, he, he was in with, you know, a, a horse doll sized group, um, the way, pretty much the way you described there. Um, but then I would come out and I would notice that he had been pulling wool off of one of them. And then I would notice which one it was and I'd pull that one out. But I guess I was starting with, I was starting with younger sheep also. Maybe I should have just put him in with some nasty use to start with. When I finally noticed that he was playing with, um, that he was chasing some of the sheep when he was out with them, um, I put him in with the rams because I was told, you know, rams don't have a sense of humor. And he spent three months in with my rams with no problems at all. And then one day started chasing them and um, tore up the ear on one of my rams by the time my neighbor told me, he was out there chasing him um, and it's just play behavior. It's, it's, he's, he's not being um, uh, aggressive in other ways. He's just, he's just trying to play. And if they start to run, then he starts to run. And then it's just obvious play behavior, but you know, he's got more teeth than they do. So. Is there any other dog out there? Uh, at this time there wasn't, we just recently were able to adopt a, an older Great Pyrenees mm -hmm. that I thought, well, let's see if the two of them can kind of keep each other company. Um, she moves at about a tenth of the speed that he does. So um, so I haven't actually seen them play. He does like to play with my Border Collies. So maybe I need to just get him out and play with the Border Collies every day. I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, we we finally kind of gave it up and put them in a pen behind the house and haven't put them out with the sheep much this year. Uh, so we're um, kind of not sure what to do. And we and we lost a goat to the coyotes two days ago. So uh, we really do need them out there. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, I would have a hard time keeping that dog in my operation too. Just like you you had to put put that dog behind the house. So um, I suppose you could try a training collar. And, but mm -hmm. that would take a lot of time to, to watch your watch your dog while he was out there, and hopefully he was bad. But um, I try to set up all those situations for dogs to be bad when I can really get after them. And I really get after them with something tough like a fly swatter. I mean, it didn't take much, you know. They don't like to be swatted around with a fly swatter. And and um, uh, but that comes from litter after litter after litter after litter, and. Um, it's hard if you just get one or two dogs in your life or even, um, you know, even six or seven, you just don't see all the variety and you, and you don't have the time in your life to, or the opportunity to, um, you know, change out your dogs. But I probably would change that dog out is my, my thought that that's probably not what you want to hear, but that's, and also I, I don't think there's anything wrong with letting your, that dog play with your border collie. If that's, if you think that's something helpful. Um, I mean, you could also drag, have that, Put that dog on a, a drag, like a, a tire filled with cement, with concrete, or something yep. something similar. Slow them down. You could try something like that. We have actually tried. I, I got the recommendation to train to uh, chain him to the Pyrenees, and she doesn't like to run, so she's just a really good anchor for him. And she did keep him from chasing uh, my llamas the other day because she just wasn't interested in running. Uh, and so the two of them kind of go out as a pair, but I don't like to do that for a lot of time because I don't want them to get hung up on something. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The pair is also actually that's a quick question. You guys have the what you refer to as the American white dogs um, have the pair seems to be very I just got her two months ago. She seems to be very um, uh, affected by the heat. She's she's panting all the time is um or do they just 
have more of a problem because they've got so much more hair? I guess I'll try to answer that. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I, I try to encourage producers here in Texas to get short haired dogs. Um, obviously, it can be very hot here and we have a lot of humidity in the eastern part of the state. Um, you know, I, I don't know, uh, Julie, may, you may disagree with me, but um, I do routinely shear the, the bellies and the inner legs of our guard dogs and up through their chest. Um, you know, I'll take it down to about a half an inch of hair. Uh, it makes a huge difference on our long hair dogs uh, when we do that. Um, but we'll have a dog going from just laying underneath a tree all day long to up and actually guarding and, and moving around during the heat, uh, just losing some of that hair around their bellies. Um, and, you know, as long as you don't peel them down to bare skin, um, I, I don't think you'll have any issues with, with, with sunburn or anything like that. And really properly grooming your long haired dogs, constantly getting them brushed out, um, get all that dead hair uh, out as much as possible. Yeah, I think I could make a sweater. I could probably spin a sweater out of all of the all of the hair I've pulled off of that dog. Like I said, I've just had her for two months, so I didn't know they shed that much. It looks like I exploded oh, it, a dog every time I get done with her. <laughs> oh yeah, it's a lot and it's constant with the, the long haired dogs in the warmer areas. Um, I guess I would go back to your first question that you had before the, the adolescent question. Um, yeah, for 80 acres, uh, I'd seriously look at, you know, an invisible fence system if they're leaving the property. Um, whether it's the, you know, the, the two that I'm familiar with is either the invisible fence brand system. Um, that's the one that we currently are, are kind of trying out. And then I've got one of the, the spot on collars um, that I'm testing also. Um, both of them kind of have their pros and cons, but uh, they do work. Um, you know, on, on a longer haired dog like a Pyrenees, you're probably going to have to trim some of that hair uh, off the front of their neck so that the uh, oh, electrodes will make contact. But trust me, when it, they get shocked a few times and they're not going to cross a boundary. Okay. Yeah, so far I haven't had wandering problems. I've just had the chasing problems with the one. But I just wondered if maybe since they're only in a, you know, four acre pen instead of a, you know, really big space, maybe that's lending towards more boredom because they're not getting that seven miles a day that your dogs are, are covering. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't see a lot of... Um... Oh, bad behavior in our pups, um, mainly because their 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 pen size is constantly progressing, um, and so as long as you don't have really young animals, we did have an issue with our last round or current round of dogs. Um, we had some lambs and kids born in the in the bonding pens because some of my bonding animals got bred unexpectedly. Um, and so we had some issues with those, but uh, once they were pulled, um, we didn't have the, those playful behaviors anymore with the with the dogs. Okay, so I started out with two young a uh, two younger critters probably, which gave him the idea that wool is fun to play with. Actually, he mostly grabs the wool and pulls at it. So, you know, it doesn't look like the play behavior that I've seen in my collies at all. And Janice, I would just add, um, you know, I know this is a, a webinar on livestock protection dogs, but, you know, ultimately the goal here is to reduce predation and and for an 80 acre parcel, uh, you know, that's a, a much smaller area. Um, <clears throat> certainly livestock protection dogs can, can be effective there, but you may want to look at, um, you know, kind of an integrated approach um, with other other tools as well using predator proof fencing you know actual permanent fencing uh, around your property i know that gets to be expensive and 80 acres is is relatively small compared to some of the the spaces that we deal with out here in the west but it's still a lot um and so that can that those costs can add up but um using predator proof fencing um there are a variety of you know you know even if it's just night penning um, or using box lights or other deterrents like that. Um, using all these things in combination um, can can help to to increase your effectiveness as opposed to just relying on any one single tool. 
yeah we've we've done that the we have a we have a stream that runs through our property and no no fence and it floods every spring so no fence can withstand it so so we always have to put up temporary um temporary mesh fences um and so our 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 system for years has always been temporary electric fences llamas uh bringing them in at night the coyotes are now hunting in the day by the way the last two times i've killed things has been 10 in the morning um and um and uh you know a variety of these things but the coyotes sooner or later we fall down on something and they figure it out so yeah, that was they're, why we, they're smart we, smart critters and they're always yeah. they're always going to try to figure out some new way and none of our yeah. tools are effective forever um so uh yeah. sorry that well, you're having to deal with that and that's yeah well that's why i stepped up to the stepped up to the uh um dogs because the the, the llamas do a pretty good job if they stay close to the sheep and goats but if they get far away from them they do nothing so yeah and and the electric fences help but boy there are a lot of work to put up and down all the time yeah absolutely um it looks like we had a question in the chat um that the bill's kind of already answered but just in case you guys haven't seen it uh jason suko asked what is the lifetime expectancy for a dog to be effective uh, Bill says we see dogs be effective until about 10 plus years of age if they've been treated well during those years. Uh, Julie, would you agree with that? Yep, sure would. Great. Any other final questions? I know we're at 730. All right, everybody. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to go ahead and just drop my contact information into the chat. Um, in case you, you didn't catch it earlier, um, Julie, Bill, feel free to do the same if you'd like. Um, we appreciate you spending this evening with us. And if you have any further questions, feel free to reach out. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Did you put Thank you. Good. Thank you.